we started taking a look at, you know, my, my arrival into this field as a scientist kind of coincided at the time that people said, let's not just make more milk, let's try to improve fitness and functionality of, of the cow through genetic selection. All right, welcome to this episode of the Dairy Podcast Show. My name is Gail Carpenter. I'm the State Dairy Extension Specialist for Iowa State University. And I'm joined today by Dr. Kent Weigel uh, from UW-Madison. Dr. Weigel is a professor and chair of the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences at UW-Madison, where he holds a research, extension, and teaching appointment. Over the last 30 years, Dr. Weigel and his graduate students and postdocs have carried out translational research and impactful outreach that has improved the lives of dairy farmers and their cattle in Wisconsin, North America, and beyond, while generating more than 200 publications in leading peer-reviewed journals to date. Studies of novel genetic traits have included methods for analyzing health data from on-farm herd management software that led to the implementation of national genetic evaluations for common herd health disorder or common health disorders in U.S. dairy cattle, as well as establishment of a genomic reference population for dry matter intake, residual feed t- intake, and its components, which led to implementation of national genetic evaluations for feed efficiency in U.S. dairy cattle. Studies of novel breeding strategies have included application of genotype imputation methods to the design and implementation of low-density single nucleotide polymorphism arrays that facilitated low-cost genomic testing of more than 100,000 dairy calves per month, as well as analysis of founder contributions to inbreeding depression and use of new methods to measure inbreeding at the genome level. Lastly, studies of genome-enhanced and precision dairy management tools have included the use of machine learning algorithms, lip chart analyses, and related tools to predict insemination outcomes and assess breeding strategies, prediction of whole genome risk for hypoketonemia, and prediction of daily dry matter intake from sensor and metabolite data. That is a mouthful. I'll be honest, as a nutritionist, um, maybe not quite as smart as a geneticist. I I understood most of that, I think. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, let's, uh, I'm already regretting the bio that I sent you, Gail. That was really, really uh, it sounds fascinating, though. So it sounds like a lot of big words for some really applied stuff, actually. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we can start by unpacking some of that if you want. Uh, so like most animal geneticists or dairy geneticists, right, we spent the better part of the last half of the last century, which, you know, I caught the very tail end of, right, improving things like milk production per cow, milk components, and then in the 90s started getting into the health traits and longevity and those sort of things. And we were behind some of the other countries, in particular in Europe and Scandinavia, and specifically in measuring and evaluating things like stillbirths, calving ease, longevity, mastitis, and so on, because we didn't have national veterinary recording programs and so on. But we started kind of modestly with longevity and somatic cell count as a proxy for mastitis. And and that was good. And then in the early 2000s, got into female fertility and improved the calving ease evaluation, started looking at stillbirths and those sorts of things, which are economic and welfare issues, right? There are a lot of things that dairy farmers sort of take for granted, right? If I have Holstein cattle, let's say, I'm going to have a percentage of calves that are going to be stillborn and I just can't do anything about it. And I'm going to have a percentage of calves that I have to pull because that's just the way it is. Well, it doesn't really have to be that way. And we've made some pretty significant improvements there on, on those traits. And then we started taking a look at, you know, my, my arrival into this field as a scientist kind of coincided at the time that people said, let's not just, make more milk, let's try to improve fitness and functionality of of the cow through genetic selection. Heritabilities are low, which means big environmental effects. And we had to get a lot better at measuring some of these things, and they actually are under genetic control. So we did a lot of work, uh, some of the early work here on using health event data from dairy comp or PCDAR, DHI plus, whatever software to select for cows with fewer health, early postpartum health problems, mastitis, metritis, DA, ketosis, and so on. 
And that research was done, you know, early 2000s. It got implemented, you know, 10, 12, 13 years later, which is often the case nationally. And, and so that was good. And we did some crossbreeding research at the same time, in part because crossbreeding was gaining popularity and there was a lot of ideas about how this will be amazing. We'll get more milk, we'll get fewer problems of every kind and so on. And so we got a little bit into that. I think results of that were probably as expected, right? You give up some milk, you gain some fitness, some fertility as one would expect. And it maybe changed the way people looked at Holstein cattle and some of the things we thought were possible. Yeah. Crossbreeding is actually the number two breed in Iowa. Crossbred cows. Yep. Yep. So doesn't mean they're any one particular cross, but if you just put all the crossbreds in one group with each other, they're the, they're our number two breed after Holsteins. And what are the breeds or breed rotations that you're seeing the most of? Um, a little bit of everything, uh, honestly. So I see Holstein Jersey crosses, um, see some of the, the pro cross coming in a little bit too. Some of that Montbelliard influence a little bit. Um, but I don't think, I don't think we're seeing any, any one particular, everybody's kind of got their own little, little tweak on it and they have their, their favorite cross that they like to play with. So, but yeah, if you, if you look at number of cows in Iowa, we're, we're, we got a pretty heavy crossbred cut population. So I don't know if that's unique to Iowa or if that's something that you're seeing nationwide, but. I think it's different parts of the country. I don't know if it's nationwide, but certain areas it's kind of more popular than others. And, and some, you know, some overall trends toward it. I, I'm encouraged that we're now getting to the point where folks are being planful about it and having kind of long-term vision of what we want 10, 15 years down the road with the herd. It was a little bit discouraging in the early years. You'd go on a farm and they'd, oh, we bought semen from this breed and we created all these calves and, you know, they aren't even out of the yet. And they've already said, oh, I don't like those. This is a failure. Like, how do yeah. you know? They're like six weeks old, right? And yeah. <laughs> so, you can't change your breeding plan that quickly, right? You have to be. Yeah. Maybe you can change your ration. You know, that's your area. You can change. You shouldn't probably change it every six weeks. You could. You, you can't change your genetic program, but, you know, by definition, that's a multi-generation thing, right? Well, and I wonder how much the, you kind of alluded to this a little bit. I'm not going to say this in most the most politically correct way I could probably. So um, I wonder how much the Holstein breed um, screwed themselves over maybe a little bit. Um, or that's probably, again, probably not the most politically correct way to say that. But probably not. With, but... with, that, <laughs> with, the, with that emphasis on, I know we gave up a lot on that repro side um in when you were getting in in the in the 90s in there and um and i've seen even my career has not been as long as yours um but i've even seen since i've you know graduated college some some leaps and bounds in that area so i think the i think there's a swing back that we're seeing to more of those health and longevity um and fitness traits you call them um, yeah, for sure. And if you don't like the health, longevity, fitness thing, or that's sort of too fluffy for you, then, you know, think of it in terms of income and expenses, right? You can maximize production and maximize income, but still expenses are real. And those are not just feed, but labor, all the interventions you have to make, the veterinary costs, the culling and replacement costs and discarded milk, those things are, are really the dead calves, all those things really add up, right? And and then there's the, the sort of welfare and perception piece of it too that's important. And I think at the time that I was trained in grad school in the you know late 80s, early 90s, the attitude was, well, if it's you know 20 or 30 or 40 percent heritability, and we can get the data for free through DHI or breed association type programs or whatever, then it's worth selecting. And if the heritability is you know, 5% or 8% or 3%, well, we shouldn't worry about it. We'll let the nutritionists and physiologists, you know, develop uh, ways to solve those problems. And it's not our problem as geneticists. Well, and that's not really true, right? I mean, some of those things we could improve if we tried and, and now we're trying, right? And it actually works, right? So you can find, even though the heritability, let's say a female fertility is really low because there are huge environmental influences, and, you know, people like Milo Wiltbank and Richard Persley and others, you know, Paul Freaky can do great things with off-sync and resync 
we can also fix it genetically or, or at least contribute to fixing it. Uh, some it makes our job a lot easier on the reproduction and nutrition side if we're working with a strong genetic base. Yeah, and, and I, you know, for me, kind of a come to Jesus moment, if you will, was we had actually been doing some work on male fertility, analyzing the data, and kind of as a byproduct, you get female fertility analysis too. So not fertility of the semen, but fertility of the cow, right? And I thought, what the heck, I'll just look at the, the list, and this was you know, 25 years ago, right? And I saw oh, there's a bull with thousands, tens of thousands of daughters and hundreds and hundreds of sons in the breeding program. And it is god awful. He was like the worst bull in the breed. Now I'm going to say which one it is. Probably nobody remembers him anyway, but I thought, this is bad. Like, um, every farmer doesn't need to necessarily look at every one of these traits. How much ketosis does daughters of this bull have? Or, you know, every single trait that we offer, even feed efficiency now. But if you're like a sire analyst uh, for a breeding company, or you're one of the elite breeders that's flushing your, um, you know, best cows or heifers and making the next generation of breeding stock, you probably shouldn't do that. You should probably have the information to, to know this is, this animal is a disaster for this fitness or welfare trade, and we should, we should probably pick somebody else. And I think that's kind of where the role of a lot of those traits are, because when you get 20 or 30 different traits, it gets to be like information overload. Nobody wants to look at all those for every bull. And they really don't have to. But. You're kind of counting on the, on the, people producing those genetics to do that pre-screening for you, basically, yeah, right? I mean, th that just shouldn't happen. You shouldn't have hundreds of, of sons at the breeding companies from bulls that, you know, are going to set the breed back by, you know, two or three, preg you know, points of preg rate single-handedly, right? That's Yeah, yeah. Well, and we have so many more tools for this now than we did in the, in the late second half of the last century, like you were saying, with genomics and everything, right, that we, we can these bulls so much better yeah yeah so that's kind of the next chapter right is late uh two, like 2009 2010 as geneticists the world changed entirely right because we had the sequence of the of the cow and could start imagining at least being able to not rely on progeny testing and these long periods of creating daughters waiting for them to grow up see how they did adjust do it again right and we could do things directly based on the genome. And it was a lot of fun at the beginning. The, the first couple of years was helping the breeding companies and someone understand how to use this information. They caught on very quickly because it's in their interest to do so. And they all have master's PhD level geneticists too. So it was a very easy and short learning curve. But could we take this to the masses? and not have it be a technology like say embryo transfer that was always just limited to a small population percentage of the population could we sort of uh, make it for everybody and that was reducing the cost so you, the stuff about genotype imputation was exactly that how do you take this from a 250 dollars an animal test to 30 or 40 dollars an animal and the technology was there or the, the methods were there in humans when they're combining different DNA microarray data from different companies for medical purposes. And, you, and I won't get too far into the details, but basically it's like a jigsaw puzzle, right? If you, somebody throws a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle on the table, like, you know, at home, my wife, I, I'll wait for her to, you know, to, to do the first half of it or the first third of it. Then I can walk yep. by and stick in pieces <laughs> and make it look great. Like, right? And once you know the, the sequence or the markers of the, older animals, the ET donor cows and the popular sires of sons, you can fill in the blanks for the calves very easily and you don't have to pay all the money. And all of a sudden we went from a, a few thousand animals being tested to 100,000 calves a month. And then it gets really cool, right? And you can start using this for management decisions and stuff. And in our case for research, it gets really cool because you can start looking at traits that you couldn't before whether it's something related to calf health or specific diseases, or in our case, feed efficiency. Right? So feed efficiency research was done, a lot of it in the UK and Netherlands and places like that in the 80s and early 90s, and they just stopped because they said, 
yeah, there are differences between animals, but we physically and financially can't measure dry matter intake on every daughter of every bull every year because it would cost, you know, tens of millions of dollars a year and you just couldn't do it because you don't have the facilities and the labor, right? But if we can make these so-called reference populations of animals with feed efficiency, feed intake data and genomic data, and then use that to predict everybody else, from the genome, it actually works at least reasonably well, right? And so that's what we've been working on since about 2000. Can we talk about that a little bit more? That's one of the so some of these traits I think have a lot bigger economic impact um, than we give them credit for. So I think feed saved is a huge one. The other one that I think you've been doing a little bit of work in is this idea of resilience. Um, how do you how do you measure these things and and what what do you see the impact of of these traits being? Yeah, so let's we'll talk about the feed efficiency and, and feed save first, and then we'll save set resilience aside because that's kind of where we're going next, and we're still trying to figure that out. So we got a federal grant, we being uh, UWS and Iowa State, Michigan State, Florida, um, are being the main ones plus the USDA Ag Research Service, not the competitive grants, but the USDA researchers to start looking at this and start measuring feed efficiency on a big number of cows and it's kind of hard like this is why nobody did it before because it takes a lot of labor and and stuff but you can do it at the research farms uh, like at Iowa State Kalen Gates and Gene State does it by way back we have uh, the Ensign Tech system from the yep. Netherlands yeah. they were doing it when I was an undergrad at MSU um, and now I now I still see it being done here at Iowa State so it's kind of fun that I get to feel like I've been seeing it for a while, so. Exactly, yeah. And so what we decided to do, Mike Vandahar at Michigan State was the leader of this deal and of the grant, right? And so we said, let's focus on mid-lactation because you avoid the craziness of the weight loss and production and body weight changes in their first uh, weeks. And then at the very end, uh, you have the pregnancy effects and stuff. So we focused on 50 to 200 days in milk as the time period and over time now we've kind of settled on a measurement protocol of needing at least six weeks of data where you have every day right the data and usually there's a week training period in advance of that depending on what system you have cows have to get used to the gates and stuff and so we are measuring about 325 cows a year at madison uh, the other universities collectively are doing probably another seven, eight hundred. So we had about a thousand cows a year, maybe a little more to the database. We've come, uh, collaborated some with the Canadians and other countries now too. But we're trying to build this national database, and there are about I think between six and seven thousand cows in there now that have genomic test data of their own, and then they have at least six weeks of feed intake data, and then, of course along with that comes all the components of residual feed intake, which I haven't talked about yet, but it, it's the energy sinks. So milk energy, secreted milk energy, this is your nutrition, right? So this is easy stuff for you. Um, the metabolic body weight. So how much, how much intake do you need to make milk? How much intake do you need to maintain your body size if you weren't making milk? And then how much do you need for body weight change? So those are kind of the three components. And we've improved efficiency over time just by making more milk, but at then uh, we get into this sort of diminishing returns or multiples of maintenance that you can explain, I'm sure, better than I can. But at some point, you keep adding more milk and you get m smaller and smaller marginal gains in efficiency and, and it almost plateaus out, right? And now we have to start measuring differences between individual cows and what they actually eat. And so residual feed intake takes a cohort of cows, which, like in our case, we have 64 cows in our pen that we have the electronic bins. The, the cohort could be all 64 cows if we're just feeding them the herd diet. If somebody is doing a research project like a Heather White, let's say, might have two diets, well, then we have two cohorts of 32 cows because it's everybody who's eating the same diet at the same time, right? And then which cows ate more than they needed, sort of in quotes, where needed is based on those energy sinks, and which cows ate less than they needed, and and the less than they needed ones are are considered efficient, right? So negative negative residual feed intake. That gave a lot of people, I think, some heartburn initially. 
residual feed intake in beef cattle was already established and quite common. And then if you get into pigs and chickens, it was more ratios of gain to feed or feed to gain, which measures of feed efficiency. But those animals have fairly simple job of just growing and gaining weight, whereas a milk cow, lactating cow has to make milk, maintain or gain weight, uh, potentially, especially growing if you're still in first lactation, and then reproduce and all this other stuff because she has to come back next year. There's no right. slaughter. Right, she's very anymore. complicated. Yeah, and it's so it's harder, but it, it's encouraging also that we spend a fair amount of time looking at do the efficient or low RFI animals have more health problems. We said, you know, back at the beginning of this lactation, did, where you're measuring feed intake, did they have more postpartum health problems? Well, no, we didn't find that. Well, what about the beginning of the next lactation? Maybe they're in negative energy balance and you're selecting for that. No, they actually were okay. And, and there is real genetic variation that is just in terms of efficiency. It's, we don't know all the reasons for it. Some of the beef research would suggest that it has to do with how efficiently cows can sort of make, uh, add or break down body tissues. There's heat loss, there's activity, there's all sorts of different things. I think health and immune function is part of that. So the healthier cows are also uh, as good or more efficient. So uh, you're just not, I, I hate to sort of anthropomorphize here or sort of commingle animals and humans, right? But, you know, you're not really efficient when you're sick in, in, in any way. Cows are not efficient. If you have to support that immune system, you're not going to be supporting milk production. Right, exactly. So that's been a lot of fun. So we collected data for six or seven years uh, on that project from USDA funding. And we got some funding from Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding, Foundation for Food and Ag Research. And then in, in 2020, we finally said, okay, I think we have enough. And we worked with Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding, which is the group that does genetic evaluation of dairy cattle. And they released finally national genetic evaluations for residual feed intake. And then one of the side benefits we got were better estimates of the cost of body size, because a lot of that data in the NRC was quite old. Now we had thousands and thousands of animals with body weight data and feed intake data. So we got newer estimates and it turns out it costs a little bit more to maintain big cows than we thought it did. So that was also part of it. And they put those two pieces together, you get feed saved. And you know, the, the breeding values then are available for bulls and, and heifers and cows. The reliabilities aren't as high as we'd like. You know, we're used to having 80, 70, 80% reliability for traits like milk production. They're measured on millions of animals. Here you're talking, you know, 30, 40% reliability for traits that are only measured on thousands of animals, but it's a whole lot better than nothing, right? And, and we keep adding. Gives you a starting point. Is that something we're going to be able to measure at some point in our, our minor breeds like jerseys? I don't want to call them minor, but you know, there's, they're less common than Holsteins. Yeah. Numerically smaller breeds, yeah. I guess. Right? <laughs> yeah. Politically Maybe, I don't know. Um, I don't know, honestly, I, there's a desire to do that. I think that there are not enough research herds out there that we have big research herds of jerseys. We don't have jerseys in our research herd at Madison. We used to. Now we moved over to Dairy Forage, which is a USDA farm, in part because if you have two breeds on the research farm, as you know, you start designing experiments and you start saying, I need uh, second and third lactation cows and they have to be this many days in milk and so on. And pretty soon you just run out of cows, right? So having two breeds makes you run out more than twice as fast, actually. I was going to say twice as fast, but it's even worse than that. Right? That's right. yeah. slicing. <laughs> So, but I think there are other ways. I think indicator traits, I'll talk about some of those maybe in a minute, some proxies. I think honestly in jerseys, and I've talked a little bit with the folks at the association about this, that jerseys are unique in a sense that there aren't that many sire families. You know, it's sort of a really small breed, right? Pretty aggressive in terms of genetic selection. And it's, they're overrepresented in large herds. So you could actually imagine a, working with some commercial herds where you just have the top 10 bulls and you know on your farm you have 50 daughters of bulls one three six seven and eight and i have one two nine and ten or whatever right and you've got you could actually do pen based work you could have a pen of 
two-year-olds from this sire and that sire. And that would be actually really accurate data. I think you could do it on pen base. Well, that's how the beef folks got their, they, they got pen data, right? Yeah. To get their residual feed intake. Do that. Yeah. Because there's just so many, you know, these herds with now thousands or tens of thousands of jerseys. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Not like the 30 jerseys that we have at our Iowa State herd. <laughs> yeah. I mean, measuring it individually is hard. There are some folks trying to do on commercial or semi-commercial herds or like partnerships or whatever, right? Measuring individual intakes, but you have to have not only the equipment, you have to have, you know, our, like in our case, you don't buy the Incentec bins and get them installed and then magic data shows up every day. You have to have people watching every day, making sure that cows aren't stealing or throwing feed or, you know, you have a power outage and now the data aren't, you can't use today, or you can never let the bins get empty, right? Because you can't get tailing gates like we have one cow per per gate you can never let the bin go empty because then now you don't have residual feed intake because it wasn't ad lib feeding anymore right so there's just a lot of ongoing maintenance and i just don't see commercial farms being able to manage that or or being incentivized enough to manage that it's just i don't see it but you know there are some proxies there's a lot of work in in denmark and Kind of started it now other people are doing it looking at can we use computer vision or videos right to look at the depth of the feed pile so the feed pile in front of the cow is shrinking shrinking and then she leaves and then how big was it and then the next cow comes in and it shrinks a little more and you can kind of measure intake i'm skeptical how well you can do that when like they're just at a, a rail or that you know they're all sort of sharing the feed pile right it, probably a little easier if there are dividers, which is not common, of course. Well, and, and I don't, I would imagine you'd have to do, and you're, you're more in tune with some of this research than I am, but, but different diets are going to have different densities, right? So just because you might have a diet that's fluffier, so to speak, and be a little taller. So it's probably something you have to calibrate to that farm's diet, I would expect, or? Yeah, sorting, yeah. right? Sorting is going to come into play for sure. Oh, yep. Right. And there's, and then one of the folks Joao Doria here on our faculty has been looking at, can you augment that with, uh, again, with the cameras, the videos of how much of time is the nose touching the feed pile? You know, nose contact with feed, which is kind of kind of flipping it around, right? Instead of feed disappearance. And then you have the wearable sensors, you know, the sensors to measure rumination and potentially you can imagine that you, you have the, certainly the sensors to tell how much time she's at the bunk, right, versus lying down. And, and I think some of those data will help, but it's going to still have to be a core of real feed efficiency data where we actually do the intakes. So, yeah, so that's kind of where we're going. And, and then there's the feeding behavior part, which is cool. So one of the things we've found, and, and others have found this previously, beef cattle, with the Incentec system, we get every meal in the the timing and the quantity, you don't get that with Kaling Gates, which is just a daily thing, but the cows that eat faster have, tend to have poorer residual feed intake, right? You know, the cows that eat a little slower um, are, are a little more efficient in a, in a way. Well, are cows that eat slower also probably sorting? It's because sorting behavior is associated with slower, slower eating speed too, right? So could it possibly... That's actually a really good point. Could they be just picking out the, yeah, there you go. <laughs> they could be picking out the starchy and the higher, the goodies, right? And leaving the stuff behind that's a little less energy dense. Yeah, we should probably do a study on that. I think you're, I think you're onto something. Because, yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, there's, um, again, you don't want to sort of equate animals and humans, but I'm going to do it again, right? People would say, oh, you know, graze throughout the day. Don't, you know, just twice a day eat a giant piece and you're, better off. I don't know if that's true, but there seems to be some relationship, yeah. right? Yeah. Eating and, big and then we should, we're doing some behavioral, so we can measure that kind of behavior electronically. And then we have a student who's doing a cool project, uh, Faith is her name, and, and we call it Hunger Games, <laughs> but it's changing the stocking density. So uh, one-to-one, uh, so you basically lock the cows away from the feed, then you release them to the bunk, either at a one-to-one, density or two to one, four to one or eight to one and try to 
identify the more aggressive cows and then you can or look at things like latency from the time you you know open the gates to who gets to eat first and there's relationships with with uh, lactation number there right the if you have only first lactation cows together or only older cows together the dynamic is a little more stable if you mix the two there's there are more competitive interactions and then when the cow does get in the her turn she eats really fast because she doesn't know how long she'll get to stay before she gets you know knocked out by another cow and and all those things are kind of cool and those really all of those interactions are just exacerbated once you get on farm right especially if you've got a farm that's most farms are going to be over 100 percent stocking density on their lactating cows and so i think that kind of accelerates all of that behavior stuff yeah so you know our, our thing right now in feed efficiency is to keep increasing the reference population size which is great and then do this sort of add-on research with cameras and you know the video cameras the all the wearable sensors the thermal cameras right diane uh, spurlock when she was still at iowa state we got the heat loss with thermal cameras and try and understand it a little better and maybe find some proxies that'll help us measure on commercial farms and then now expanding to methane because people care about that too and and it's if you're going to measure methane it's probably good to measure it on the same cows where you're already measuring intake because then you can disentangle what's actually happening, right? And so we're starting to do some green feed measurements. Um, I think James is going to start doing some at Iowa State and, and others too to look at the methane production. And you can do that in a couple of ways, and you may know more about this than I do, but like the green feed system, you can actually get methane production, which is really nice, where the cows go and get some pellets and did it you know, several times a day. Or you can have the sniffers, so-called sniffers in the robot systems and the, the box robots. And those are really efficient because you can get a lot of cows really quickly, get a lot of methane data, but all you get is kind of methane to CO2 ratio. And then you have to predict how much CO2 she should have had and from her body weight and from milk production and predict how much methane she should have had. and and you could kind of rank the animals, but you're a few a few steps out on the limb. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's probably good supplemental data, but maybe not uh, the best thing in terms of the main data source. I think we need green yeah. feed for that. Yeah. Oh, the methane. Yeah. So that's kind of where we want to go next is try to establish a, a reference population for that and, and learn more about how to do it. And, there are a few aspects to it. There's the genetic piece, which of course is interesting to me. There's the feed uh, or ration composition formulation part that's probably more interesting to you. You can do things like, uh, you know, with fiber or with feed additives mm -hmm. or things to change methane production. Some of those are, at least as I understand, financially feasible, some are not. I mean, I saw somewhere that the that incorporating the seaweed, dried seaweed into dairy cow rations would cost like 25 bucks per cow per day. Mm -hmm. okay. That's not too useful, right? Not right now, um, no. <laughs> and then it's interesting to me to, as a geneticist, uh, like how far can you push this? Cows don't produce methane just for the hell of it, I assume. Uh, so if you reduce it 20% or whatever, I could kind of see well, that might be a good thing. If you reduce it by 80%, what happens to the cow? Like, it may be something bad. I don't know, like health-wise, who knows? And then, of course, there's the rumen micro part of it uh, because those little buggers are the ones that are making it, right? So you have to get the rumen microbiologists involved. So it's really cool stuff, I think, but we're kind of at the front edge of the learning there. Yeah, I think it's going to be a while before we have it all figured out. Oh, for sure, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, resilience is an area that we're trying to get into. There are others. Uh, Luis Brito at uh, Purdue is doing some stuff. There was a, a really nice thesis from Bogan, a PhD student uh, who just finished there and looked at that. And, and it has to do with consistency of performance. Right? So, I mean, resilience broadly can cover a whole bunch of things, you know, longevity, health, all that sort of stuff. But if you think about it sort of specifically or mathematically, I guess, right, it's can we identify those cows that just show up every day and make 
whatever, 140 pounds of milk, um, day after day, no matter if it's hot or cold or windy or raining or, you know, if the rat, if the uh, feed quality is great or the feed yeah, not quite as great today. And there's some evidence that there is, there are differences in this, right? And certainly there's heat stress data from a lot of species that show that certain families have a different point of onset of heat stress and different loss in performance as, as the heat gets worse. Or there's some data in pigs and chickens where the animals with really consistent daily intakes had fewer health problems, even when challenged with diseases, that kind of stuff, they were more resistant to disease. So you want animals that are, have consistent performance, and then if they do have a problem, they recover quickly and don't yeah. just tank, right? And, and we even saw in some, a few of our feed efficiency trials where we switched silo bags and the feed quality wasn't very good. Uh, you know, of the 64 cows, maybe 30 or 40 of them would drop in, in the intake. And some of the others, no problem. They just keep going. And so yeah. what is happening there? And I think it's really kind of cool to, try and understand what's happening there. Yeah, I think that that's something I've been kind of watching a little bit. I think there's a lot of potential in that space. Um, and I think it ties in with just, you know, overall farm efficiency. And, and when we talk about emissions reductions, I think a lot of times, I at least I hope, as we're breeding for these cows who have more longevity, um, they're more efficient, they're less likely to have problems. If As we're breeding for more low problem cows, I think we're breeding for cows that are more sustainable um, because you don't have to replace them as often. And so you have to raise fewer replacements. And I think as you look at the whole farm system, some of these, some of these traits, like even though they're not maybe as, as sexy as, as methane reduction, but if you're looking at things like feed saved or resilience, I suspect that over time, you're just looking at, at a more sustainable model of a cow. But. Yeah, and it, you know, it has implications on replacement costs and veterinary costs, but also on labor, right? Because every time you touch the animal, it, there's a cost, right? A student some years ago, when we were looking at some of the dairy comp health data and trying to you know, sort of resolve all the creative ways farmers could record mastitis or DA or other things, um, you know, various abbreviation stuff. And yeah, one it's one of my I favorite things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he said, well, how about I just count the events and just call it good, right? And it actually worked. If you just counted how many events each cow had during the lactation, like how many times did somebody touch this cow or have to do something, you kind of got about the same results. Right? Interesting. Because yeah. Results, right. So the, and you hear that from farmers. They're like, oh, you know, you know they'll, they'll have uh, this cow that made 300,000 pounds of milk. And they're like, which cow? I never heard of her. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because she's never been to the hospital pen and never. Right. Been to you didn't have to breed her over and over again. You didn't have to. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I think there's room to, to do some stuff there. It gets it gets a little mind uh, bending when you like we started talking with some of our nutrition folks here about like how geneticists how we interpret that and and say resilience of feed intake and then they start asking you know mean questions like well maybe uh, isn't it good if a cow adjusts her intake because the feed was off so she adjusts and compensate because you know, now she's sort of managing her body. I'm like, oh boy, this is harder than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have to kind of like they're arguing. Well, cow shouldn't just eat exactly the same amount every day. Cow should, you know, kind of adjust on the fly. To yeah, be be smarter about what they're yeah, eating. Right. Yeah. So, uh, oh boy. Okay. I guess. <laughs> right. Well, I wanna I wanna switch gears a little bit here. Um, something that that came out while we were emailing before we um before our conversation today uh you're pretty involved well obviously you're the chair of your department so you're pretty involved on on a lot of different aspects of of what's going on with that um yeah, it's animal and dairy worse. science now right uh at uw so um what are you what are you seeing with the with the students that you that you're running through your department and and what do you think that means for the industry in the long term yeah, I mean, the demographics are changing, right? As you know, I often say that, you know, here in Wisconsin, at the time when I decided to go to college, there were 30,000 farms and five kids apiece. And now there are, what, 6,000 farms with 2.2 kids apiece or something. So the pool of farm kids has shrunk dramatically. And even some of the so-called farm kids 
now don't actually didn't actually grow up on the farm. Right. Their, their parents owned it, but they live in town and or down the road, and and it's all managed by um, permanent labor, often Hispanic labor or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they haven't really spent like they don't know how to do this stuff. Yeah. We did when you grew up on a farm, right? Um, which is fine, right? But it's just a different dynamic. Mm -hmm. And then we get the you know, same here as Iowa State or anywhere else. The huge number of students with animal interests that sort of start with volunteering at a, a vet clinic or animal shelter or, you know, walking dogs or whatever, and, and not necessarily interested in agriculture, but they're interested in animals at vet school, of course, right? So, um, yeah, how do we sort of adjust our programs that way? And, and it's really an interesting problem so we're, and also the interests of the, the so-called farm kids have changed too, because it's not just about managing cows anymore or pigs or chickens or beef cattle or whatever, but managing people and, and money. Yeah, right? so yeah, exactly. Who are from farms, especially larger farms, still go to college, but they don't want to major in dairy science. Let's say they might want to major in business or egg business or something. So it's really interesting. Um, recruiting area or, or dynamic of, and how do we get non-farm kids interested in jobs in food and agriculture because there are a lot of them right yeah i i don't know about you if i had so i coach our dairy challenge team here so i have to think a lot about how teams fit together um and if i was going to put together a perfect team i'd have a mix of both of both students I, obviously the kids who come from a dairy are going to have a lot of benefits. They really understand the industry. They live and breathe the industry. They, they understand a lot of the ins and outs that you can't necessarily get across in all of, all of your classes. But these kids that don't come from a farm, they ask so many good questions, right? They're always thinking, they're always thinking outside the box. Um, they're, they're, questioning a lot of things. And I think there's a lot of value in just that questioning, right? And just, well, why have we always done it this way? Um, they just bring in a really diverse skill set. And, and to me, it just works together really well when you get a combination of both types of students. I don't know if that's what you've no, seen I, too. I think you're right. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And, and I think allowing them to special, specialize or follow their interests is really important. So one of the things I mentioned when we communicated by email a few weeks ago is that as we look to what our majors look like, there's this bias that in order to be an animal scientist or dairy scientist, you got to take nutrition, physiology, genetics, and management. And then if you take all that, then, well, maybe if there's any time extra, you could take an elective like animal welfare or digital agriculture or something like that, right? But first, you got to get your animal scientist card. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think that's a sustainable plan going forward. I think it's, we shouldn't, if a kid comes in or student comes in and we've had, you know, several recently who want a double major in computer science and animal science or dairy science, that's awesome, right? There's, there's some really good jobs out there for that. And, and we shouldn't make them spend all their time in, you know, one physiology or nutrition class after another. That's not their interest, right? And if another student's interested in animal welfare and doesn't care about genetics, Okay, that's fine. Like you can be an animal, animal welfare expert because you're going to work as part of a team anyway when you get to some company, right? They aren't going to sit there and go, you have to answer every question on every topic. You know, and if you can't answer the one on nutrition, if you can't balance the ration, I'm going to call your university. Right. I'm going to turn you back in. Yeah. <laughs> and there's so much to learn now, right? There's so much like when you were in school or even when I was in school, um, like the industry is just growing so fast and the, the amount that we understand is growing so fast. Um, and I think a lot of times um, what we're trying to accomplish with our students is not necessarily trying to download all the, all the possible information that we can into their brains, but what we're trying to accomplish is creating those students who know how to go out and find that information for themselves and have those critical thinking skills and those soft skills. And you don't, always accomplish that in like a physiology class or a, or a genetics class or even a nutrition class. Um, you know, just learning the information isn't always enough to give those people, give those students the skills that they're going to need when they, when they graduate. So. No, and they don't love it when we, you know, try to forcibly download our brains onto yep. them. <laughs> or 
disciplines. If they don't care about it, then you know at some point they're going to say, "Wow, this isn't for me," because I don't want to go through three semesters of this topic that I hate, right? In order to get a degree. Yeah, it's a changing. If we consider our students to be our um, our clients, it's a it's a changing clientele that we're working with for sure. Yeah, no, it's it's really a lot of fun. And, you know, and and it's fun seeing the new ideas they bring, and and you know, we don't have. At some universities, they have the the big equine programs, and and uh, you know, get a lot of students who are interested in horses or big companion animal cor- um, programs. We don't really have that at this point, but we do get kids with those interests and not farm animals. And then, yeah, you know, I sort of jokingly refer to sheep as the gateway drug right? yeah. because <laughs> because they never they only worked with cats and dogs. And they're sheep really, they're so cute, right? So now they get on a sheep undergrad research project with sheep and the next thing you know they're they're doing a cattle project and you know off they go right but yeah they get the you know the, it's a big jump to go from volunteering at a shelter to you know uh, collecting blood sample from a cow that's 10 times your size or well that's how I, I we talked about the jerseys earlier from a research perspective we have a few of those here um and from a teaching perspective i think that really helps um, because they're they're smaller and they're cuter and they've got those big brown eyes and they're also aggressively friendly. <laughs> yes, um, yes, they are. And so you take a you take a kid from Chicago and put them in a pen with a bunch of jerseys and they're just the friendliest thing and they just they eat that up. But so that's kind of our great way, Jug. <laughs> yeah, calves are good. Calf projects are good too, right? For that, um, you know. So first you start with a lamb and then a calf. And- yep. Yep, and next thing we know, we got them. But <laughs> but I think you're exactly right. If we're looking, I mean, we kind of view see this trend, but there's fewer and fewer dairy farms, right? And um and more jobs in the dairy industry. So um I think we do have an obligation to the industry to be able to to make these professionals um that are going to go out and fill those roles. But there's fewer farms out there that are going to be producing, for lack of a better word, these dairy kids. So yeah, um, you know, there are other trends and, and some are probably well beyond the scope of today's conversation. The, mm-hmm. the gender trends uh, didn't get didn't get more right. even with COVID, right? Because now there's even more ways for young guys to go, you know, 18 year old males to mm-hmm. go make a bunch of money really quick, right? Driving truck or working instruction or things like that. And so even fewer incentives to leave and go to college and uh, spend or borrow a whole bunch of money to do that, right? So so we see a, even an increase in the, the gender bias um, toward women. And, um, you know, some of those jobs are really, really good when you're 20. They're less good when you're, you know, 45 and, and yeah. disability or something or, you know, right? Because you've, yeah. you've been... You know, on wheelbarrows of concrete around for 20 years, right? Yeah, that'll that'll wear on you after a while. Well, we're coming out at a, at about an hour, so before we before we let you go, um, I'm gonna ask. There's three questions that we ask of every guest, so I'm gonna go ahead and shoot those at you real quick to to wrap up our discussion today. Um, our first one is, what is your favorite dairy related book or resource? Yeah, I'm gonna geek out here as a geneticist, and so we. I jokingly say, you know, NRC is the Bible for dairy nutritionists. Well, for geneticists, we have the Council, like Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding. Uh, previously, it was the USDA Animal Improvement Programs Lab, which is like the the mecca for all information you want to know about how genetic evaluations are done for all the traits, right? So if you want to know how feed efficiency works, go there and click, 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 and it's explained, right? And or any of the other traits, and maybe that's not where a normal person uh, would want to be, but for a geneticist or genetic student, it's kind of the one-stop shop for everything you need to know, at least about um, in the United States, how we do genetic selection for dairy cattle, right? Um, So that's probably where I would go. I don't expect anyone else would be interested in going. (laughs) We might have some genetics nerds listening. I'm not actually sure. Uh, so what is your favorite book or resource outside of agriculture? Um, you know, I, I, I thought about this one since you mentioned it before. I, 
I live about 45 minutes, well, about 20, 25 miles, which is 40, 45 minutes commuting. So I need to entertain myself. And so I like, I do audio books, of course, but I really enjoy a podcast too. And, and one of them that is totally unrelated to my field, I just find it is oh, I This love American that one. Life. Yes. It's uh, NPR actually makes it or whatever, right? It comes out of Chicago, but it's just these random stories about things you don't think about, right? It, it's about people in situations. They particularly focus on people, you know, like put in situations of what do they do and how did it work out? And that's probably a really awful explanation. You could probably explain it better. It's a, I was a This American Life listener pre-podcasts. It's a, when it, when it was just NPR, they did a really, you probably heard it, um, but they did a really good episode in, I think it was, it was either last year or the year before, but it was about these, um, like the, the decrease in standardized tests. Um, and so they, uh, and, and the new group of college students coming in and it's, I can't, I've recommended it to a bunch of people, but I can never remember the title. Um, yeah, I haven't, I don't recall that one, but a lot, yeah, a lot of them are sort of, some of them are education related. There was one that I listened to recently, which I think was a rebroadcast from some years earlier about in, um, I guess it was in New York or Boston or somewhere, one of the cities where they do these sort of exchange programs, take the kids from the poorest public school and take them over to the richest private school for the day and then come back, you know, some years later and ask them about that. And, and like where the teachers thought they were doing each group of kids a favor and yep. not really. Yeah, no, yeah. it really didn't. No, I think I remember that episode too. Um, yeah, they do dabble a lot on the education side and I, I get a lot of education insights out of that one. Um, yeah. So that's that, that one I really in, enjoy probably. Um, among you know, there are others that are cool that are science related or stuff, but that one just makes your makes you think about stuff that you would never Yeah. Think about otherwise. Just like how I and I maybe it's because um, you know, like sociology and psychology stuff kind of fascinate fascinates me because it's so different from what I do. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's good I think to get out of our silos every once in a while and talk to even within fields, talk between geneticists and nutritionists. And I think once you start kind of tearing down some of those silos, we get a lot of insight from, from other folks. Yeah. Uh, So the last question I have for you is in your opinion, what sets successful dairy professionals apart from those who are not? Yeah. I, I think if I had to just pick one thing, it's, it's the lifelong learning part of it. It's, it's incredible. The amount of stuff that a dairy farmer, let's just restrict it to dairy farmers for the moment, mm-hmm. has to know, right, from from nutrition to genetics, the things we've talked about, the card-carrying animal science type stuff, um, environmental laws and regulations, immigration, um, human resource, um, everything mechanical, financial. Um, yeah, I mean, it's incredible, right? And you can't know how to do everything, but I think those who are willing to, you know, put themselves out there and, and try to keep learning, I think is, is really critical. Or, you know, obviously you have to hire good people and be able to manage them, not be a jerk and, you know, employees and all those sorts of things, right? But, and then probably I'm biased also as a professor, right, to, toward the learning piece, but I think that's where, you know, the further you get away from, well, this is how dad did it. So therefore this is how I do it. And I really don't have any idea why, but that's, I'll just keep doing it because I, you know, that, that strategy just doesn't work. It's not um, flexible enough or resilient enough or whatever to adapt to how, how environment around you has changed, even though, you know, you might think, well, you know, we still farm the same way. Well, no, everything else has changed. So you have to too, right? And it doesn't, and it doesn't mean be the first one to, to go grab every technology, right? Because sometimes that's not so fun, right? There was a producer, uh, so some years ago at extension meeting, I'm totally digressing here, right? But Rick Grummer, who was, used to be on our faculty, was doing this um, shortened or no dry period research. This farmer was asking me about it. He's like, 
oh wow, I'm really, uh, you know, thinking about going with no dry period on my cows, but I'm a little worried because I have a, you know, huge problem with twinning and managing twins. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, like um, you're having difficulty with your transition you cows get rid of the dry and, <laughs> and twins and all that. And now you want to take away the dry period because um, you saw one presentation that said this might work. Uh, no, yeah. no, like, don't just <laughs> wait for some more, yeah. like wait a few years. Uh, you don't need to yeah. be at the bleeding edge of, of it, right? Yeah, anyway, you get the point. Well, I really enjoyed our conversation uh, today, um, this morning, this afternoon. I don't know when people are going to be listening to this, so... Uh, uh, but but I've enjoyed having a chance to, to pick your brain a little bit. Um, is there anywhere if people want to find more information about uh, your research or your extension program, stuff that you're working on? Is there somewhere where they can where they can find more info? Yeah, you could just go to our departmental website and, and it needs to be there. So it's just uh, Andy Sci, A N D Y S C I at wisc.edu. For the elementary sciences department. It's pretty, most of us yeah. academics are pretty easy to find. With We're Googleable. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Ken, it was great to talk to you today. Um, really appreciate you taking the time, and uh, I enjoyed our conversation.